Proverbs 27, 23. says, Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. This is talking to shepherds. Shepherds, you must know well the condition of your flocks. You have to pay attention to your herds. Here it says in the outline, young people have many practical problems. We need to spend time to study the problems of the young people in their practical living. This is what we were talking about Saturday. We not only have to study the Bible, we have to study the young people, study their problems, study the age in which they are growing up so that we can know how to practically apply the Word of God to their situation and their problems. If you can help them, they will be open to you. Let's read point two. In teaching the truth to young people, we need to learn how to teach God's economy in a experiential way. Amen. In order for us to be those who are competent to teach God's economy and fulfill our commission, we have to be on fire. This is the reason Paul reminded Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God. Today the stoves, you go there, you turn the knob, and the fire comes right, from the gas. Or you heat by electricity. Okay. And there are wood-burning stoves. Right? The older stoves are wood-burning. That is, inside you put the wood and you light them, and the fire comes from the wood. But you know, you always need air. And the wood-burning stoves, stoves have vents, right, openings. And what you need to do sometimes, there, there's a, there's a uh, you can do this way, there's also a, uh, what we call a, yeah, you go like this, and it blows the wind into the stove. Right. Brother Lee gave this illustration. Sometimes we come to teach. But when we come to teach, we just had a disagreement with our spouse or with our roommate. And that affects our spirit. Then there's no flame. But you have to teach. What do you do? If you leave this to yourself, my goodness, you will not be able to fan into flame for this meeting. Maybe you wouldn't be able to fan into flame for three days. But he encouraged the serving ones, always, before every meeting, pray together. Amen. And when you come to pray, don't just come and pray, Oh Lord, we pray for this meeting. Oh Lord, we pray for the young people. Oh Lord, open their hearts. And for, in a sense, forget about them. The serving ones must come together and fan into flame. Amen. Fan each other into flame. Amen. So very often in our true school, especially in the morning, we tell the serving ones, please forget the young people and let's come together and enjoy the Lord. Amen. And it was at this time Brother Lee told us that even don't pray all together with a group of 20, you know, a group like this. Just pray a group of three or four. And maybe more serving ones come. And you become seven. Once you become seven, no, break up into a group of three and four. Until the group reaches six the most. If a seventh one comes, break up again. Why? Because even when we have a group like this and we say, let's enjoy the Lord, let's pray. I'll be sitting there in the back. Mm. Saying, amen. Amen. Have you never done this? Maybe even in this training. We say, let's have some prayer. Oh, the same three or four pray. Amen. Amen. There's a flame, but it's, mm, you know. You know when it's on fire or not. So we need to fan one another into flame. And this also shows we must serve in the principle of the body. Serve two by two. Uh, if by ourselves, we won't, we won't make it. Okay, um, let's, 
Once we have an atmosphere of prayer, we are now ready to teach, not in a doctrinal way, but in an experiential way. Paul was speaking to them, says, as to children. You know, the children, this is a characteristic, their hearts are very narrow. You know, children very often are self-centered. Self-centered. They want something, they see something in the market. I want, I want, I want, I want. They, they react to things. And they act as if they are the center of the whole universe. This is just the way children are. This is from immaturity. They're very narrow in their in their view. They only see what they want at that moment. Okay. As parents, as older ones, well, we should not be so immature. We should not react to things this way. We should have a broader view and a broader realization. Right? Okay. Um, let's read uh, under here points. A and B and the subpoints, and we'll touch this matter of an enlarged heart, a heart that is enlarged. Okay, two things I would like to I would like to touch here. <clears throat> the matter of having our heart enlarged, not narrow. I think we need to apply this not only to the children, but also to the spouses, as well as in the church life. Whenever, uh, well, you know, one, one thing that's very common, very spontaneous with us, is to make a judgment and to express our opinion. Even when someone gives a prophecy, a sharing in the meeting, it's very easy for us to develop a thought about that person. We think, oh, that person's foolish. Oh, that person didn't do that right. Or, how could they do that? Or, you hear a report, sometimes not a report, gossip, about someone. Uh, you hear something about a sister or about a brother. We form a judgment right away. We form a judgment with one sentence of information, with just one sentence of information, we heard, this person did that. <gasps> oh, how can they do this? That person's been in the church life for five years, or 25 years. Oh, I knew it, I knew it. This is a bad brother. I knew, because this, 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 this. We heard one thing. We don't know the whole story. We also don't know, okay, my brother told me this, but did you, did you get the story accurately? I don't even know this. If it really is something that related to me, then I probably should find out more. How did you hear this? And go back to the source of the information. Why do we come to judgments over people? Our heart is narrow. And sometimes, very often, we don't give people the benefit of the doubt. Do you know this phrase? That is, mm, okay, that happened. First, I wonder whether it happened the way you say. Did it really happen that way? What were the circumstances? What was the situation? If our heart is enlarged, if we, you know, to say, when, when Paul was pleading with the Corinthians, he says this phrase, he says, make room for us. Make room for us. It's like in their heart, there was no room for Paul. Paul had to, like, uh, make room. If you've ever been on the subway in Manhattan, sometimes when you get in the subway, you have to make room for yourself. The people have to push in so the doors close. I hear Japan is even worse. 
right? They have people. They they have people that they pay on the on the platform on the metro to push the people <laughs> in. So you can say the doors open, make room for us. <clears throat> in the church life, you shouldn't have to plead with people, make room for us. Your children shouldn't have to plead with you. Your spouse shouldn't have to plead with you. Make room for us. Our heart should be broad. The Lord, very often in the Gospels, we see that he got up early, even before the dawn. We see that in Mark chapter 1 and in other places. And the dawn came, they couldn't find him. It says they had to hunt for him. Hunt for him. I think it's Matthew 1.35 around there. And, and the Lord, on other occasions, spent the whole night in prayer. Yet, you don't see the clear word that the Lord said, get up early and spend time with the Father. <laughs> right? Of course, there is one place where he says that you should, when you pray, go into your closet right? and into your private room and pray to your Father who sees in secret. But there you see one time. Yet, he built up an example of this. He built an example. Another thing when the Lord was in the boat with the disciples go to the other side and there was a storm I think we all know this story and the disciples how did they react oh, so anxious and they wake him and the Lord set a pattern there he says oh you have little faith and so then he rebukes the wind and calms the sea by not being anxious in the midst of the storm, that set a pattern. That set a pattern to them. Now we, as serving saints, and we as parents, if we tell the children, trust the Lord, trust the Lord, trust the Lord for your life. Yet, when a situation comes our way, we're <gasps> so anxious over whether it's a personal situation, family situation, a church situation, there's a problem. And we, even how do we pray? Sometimes in the prayer meeting, maybe someone is, is one of the saints is sick. And the saints pray. Oh, oh Lord. Oh Lord, our dear brother. Oh, he loves you so much, Lord. Oh, he serves you so much, Lord. Why do we need to remind the Lord? How much she serves, how much, as if, as if, Lord, this is just like what? In John chapter 11, Mary and Martha, the, uh, Lazarus was sick, and they send word to the Lord Jesus. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And the Lord hears it, says, oh, okay, let's wait two more days. The Lord is not stirred by this kind of anxiety and emotion and then after two days right then the Lord says let's go no they get word he died then the Lord says let's go then the disciples say uh, uh, he died and he says yes he's only sleeping so let's go wake him and they said Lord if he's only sleeping he'll get up on his own why do we need to go and then, so let's go anyway. Then, I think it's Thomas says, let us all go, that we might die with him. Uh, the opinions are coming out. Then they get there. Martha sees him. And what's the first thing she says? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So blaming him. Oh, you can see the emotion, you know, when the saints pray. Now, of course, we should pray. We should, you know, pray for the saints. But we don't have to pray this way. Oh, Lord. Oh. Actually, that's not, I, I'm not sure that's qualified to be called a prayer. That's just the expression of emotion. The Lord is the one what? <coughs> Sleeping in the boat. The Lord is the one what? Oh, when the one he loves is sick. Ah, oh, he waits two days very calmly. So, we need to be one with the Lord, right? 
even in our prayer, sometimes we promote a pattern of what? Anxiety toward one another. Do you trust? Is this, is this what's happening for God's economy? We need to pray in a proper way. Even in our prayers, maybe, we show the children our anxiety. So, anyway, we're a pattern in, 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 every, in every part of our living. Okay, we go back to the outline. Um, let's see, here in A it says, The apostles not only preached the gospel, but also lived it. Their ministering of the gospel was not only by word, but also by a life that displayed the power of God, a life in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. That's what we just read in verse 5. And in B, the Apostle Paul stressed repeatedly the Apostle's entrance toward the believers. This shows that their manner of life played a great role in infusing the gospel into the new converts. Okay. Um, sisters, could you read one? 